members of the judiciary, senators, deputies, secretary general of the Department of Justice, colleagues across the sector, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's Prison Law Seminar, which is hosted by the Irish Penal Reform Trust in association with the Irish Criminal Bar Association on the topic of developing sentencing guidelines in Ireland, the principles and purposes of sentencing. We are delighted that so many of you have joined us for what promises to be a most interesting and very valuable event. The event is the second of our 2021 Law Seminar series, the current seminar, ser seminar arises in the context of IPRT's interest in sentencing reform and the newly established Sentencing Guidelines and Information Committee. IPRT welcomed the establishment of the committee as an opportunity to address the current gaps in sentencing data, data and information in Ireland, consider more deeply the principles underpinning Irish sentencing practice and promote awareness and consistency in that practice. It follows an event we hosted in 2012 when we then welcomed Judge Coleman Tracy of the Sentencing Council of England and Wales to Dublin. At that event, which was in person in Comanum Jail, we were struck in particular by the role that sentencing councils play in promoting wider public confidence in sentencing and justice. Our aim in hosting this seminar this evening is to play our own small part in promoting public awareness and understanding of the concept of sentencing guidelines and start a discussion about the values and principles that should underpin any future guidelines in Ireland. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to share a few housekeeping points. So first of all, this event has been recorded and we please ask that attendees do not record the event themselves. The format of the event is that we will hear presentations from each of our three speakers and then from three respondents. Following this, we will have time for a Q&A. Um, please submit all questions for speakers and panelists in the Q&A box and we will do our best to answer as many as possible during the Q&A portion of the event. And we encourage everyone to contribute to the conversation in the chat box, but questions for speakers and panelists should please be by way of the Q&A box. Um, we would ask attendees, if you could, to please ensure your name is set as your real name and organisation where applicable, uh, so people in the chat know who they are talking to. Um, I'm told that people can tweet using the hashtag sentencing in Ireland to join on, in on the conversation online. And if anyone loses connection during the webinar, please just cl click into the webinar link again and Lorraine will let you in. So before I introduce our keynote speaker, I'd like to invite uh, Secretary of the Irish Criminal Bar Association Committee, uh, Amy Heffron, to say a few words. Yes, good, good afternoon, everyone. Just very briefly, on behalf of the Irish Criminal Bar Association, I would like to welcome everyone to the seminar, and I know a lot of our ICBA members are present today as well. ICBA would like to thank the IPRT for extending the invitation to co-host the seminar with them, which we are always delighted to do. Um, I hope everyone enjoys what I know is going to be a very interesting and informative discussion. So just thank you on behalf of ICBA. So I'll hand you back to Fiona. Okay, thanks everyone. Okay, so it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker this evening, the Honourable Miss Justice Easel Tomali. Uh, the Honourable Miss Justice Easel Tomali attended Trinity College Dublin and the Honourable Society of the King's Inns before being called to the bar in 1987. During her practice, Miss Justice O'Malley mainly specialised in criminal law, but also judicial review, extradition, immigration and housing law. She was a director of the Free Legal Advice Centre, colleagues of ours, from 1985 to 2012, where she also served as chairperson for three years. Ms. Justice O'Malley was appointed a judge of the High Court in 2012 and the Supreme Court in 2015. She is the chair of the recently established Sensing Guidelines and Information Committee. Ms. Justice O'Malley's keynote is entitled Developing Sentencing Guidelines insight from the initial work of the Sentencing Guidelines and Information Committee. Ms. Justice O'Malley, you are very welcome. We are honoured. Thank you. Um, th thank you very much, Fina. Um, I, I hope I'm coming across uh, um, properly at this stage. 
Uh, I'd like to thank you and the IPRT and ICPA for hosting this or uh, the, <coughs> this event and for inviting me to speak at it. Um, my topic this evening obviously will be the work of the Sentencing Guidelines and Information Committee and I'm sure that everybody at this event will be aware that the committee was established as a committee of the Judicial Council under the terms of the Judicial Council Act 2019. The members of the committee, there are 13 members, uh, eight of whom are judges, five of whom are lay people appointed through the Public Appointments Commission. We were appointed in July 2020 and we met for the first time that month um, until our last meeting in October this year. All of our meetings have been online, obviously. So the functions of the committee under the Act include the preparation of draft sentencing guidelines. And what happens when we do that is that the draft guidelines will be submitted to the board of the Judicial Council with a view to being put before the full council for adoption. The full Judicial Council is basically all of the judges um, in Ireland. Where the guidelines are adopted by the uh, council, the committee has to monitor their operation and it has to propose amendments where appropriate. And for these purposes, it has to collate in such manner as it considers appropriate information on sentences imposed by the courts. And it must also disseminate that information from time to time to judges and also to persons other than judges. So the general public, as well as uh, interested stakeholders. The Act sets out a number of matters that must be taken into account in the preparation of draft guidelines. Uh, the, there's quite a long list of factors, but it's important to list them all. The sentences that are imposed by the courts, the need to promote consistency in sentences imposed by the courts, the impact of decisions of the courts relating to sentences on the victims of the offences concerned, the need to promote public confidence in the system of just criminal justice. The financial costs involved in the execution of different types of sentences and the relative effectiveness of them in the prevention of reoffending. And such factors as may be considered appropriate relating to the offence concerned and the offender committing the offence. Now, this is obviously a wide ranging set of factors. It's clear that each of them is an essential feature of the process. It's also clear that they overlap with each other to some extent. Um, for example, a, a guideline produced without an understanding of the sentences actually being passed in practice risks being uh, regarded by judges as unconnected with reality. Public confidence is unlikely to be promoted unless information about sentencing is disseminated and unless that information shows that there is a clear appreciation of the impact on victims and of the value of consistency. And of course, any guidelines will respect the constitutional duty of judges to treat the individual offender in accordance with the principles of fairness and proportionality. The effectiveness of a particular sentencing option in reducing offending has always been relevant when it comes to considerations of rehabilitation in an individual case and also the general principle of deterrence. However, the, the requirement that the committee is to take the relative costs of sentencing options into account in the development guidelines may lead it into a new area to some extent uh, and involve us in consideration of factors that wouldn't normally up to now have been considered relevant in the sentencing process. Under the current legal principles relating to sentencing, cost is not usually taken into account in the sentencing decision any more than, for example, the, the availability of temporary release would be taken into account. These have usually been seen as matters for the executive, not part of the administration of justice. So the correct approach to this particular aspect, the correct weight to be attributed and how to uh, 
put it into the sentencing guidelines is a matter that needs to be addressed by us. It will have to be considered carefully and may end up having to be revised in the light of experience. The hope is that guidelines will be produced that will assist sentencing judges in their task and that will provide clear information both to the persons directly involved in the sentencing process and to the public more generally. However, it's absolutely clear that if this is to be achieved, a great deal of work needs to be done to collect and analyze data about sentencing in Ireland. Uh, perhaps the easiest part of this task has been the production of a review and summary of judgments of the Court of Criminal Appeal, the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court that set out sentence guidelines for a range of offences. Uh, this, this document is currently complete, it's being prepared for publication on the website and it should be available very shortly. I want to say a word about uh, judgments of this nature because to a certain extent that they are what constitutes the body of guidelines in this jurisdiction at the moment. The issuing of such judgments has increased greatly since the original somewhat skeptical decision of the Supreme Court in the case of the people, DPP in Tiernan in 1988. And the court expressed doubt about the possibility of giving more than very general principled guidance in circumstances where, in its view, it didn't have the range of information that would be necessary to express any more concrete views. But from about 2008 onwards, the courts have felt more confident about the availability of information because of projects such as the Irish Sentencing Information System, and thanks to work carried out uh, within the courts by judicial assistants and researchers. So at this stage, we have judgments relating to sentencing for assault, manslaughter, rape, assault causing serious harm, dangerous driving causing death or serious bodily harm, unlawful possession of firearms, possession of child pornography, robbery, burglary, some drug offences and tax and social welfare fraud. The current process for giving formal guidance in the Court of Appeal involves putting the parties to a particular appeal um, or perhaps a number of appeal, appeals dealing with the same kind of offence, putting the parties on notice that the court intends to issue a formal guidance document. So the parties then will be required to address the court on issues that go beyond the facts of the individual case or cases, and to put before the court a range of other sentencing decisions relevant to the offence. Uh, this process has been described by Mr. Justice Edwards of the Court of Appeal as descriptive or bottom up. What the court tries to do is to describe patterns in previous decisions for the purpose of setting out indicative ranges of seriousness and identifying potentially aggravating or mitigating factors. And then typically what the court does is to divide the available custodial sentencing options into three bands usually starting with from not to say five or not to seven or what, whatever way it is divisible. In other judgments, informal guidance may be given in cases where there has been no advance notice that the court wants to give a guidance judgment and the court doesn't feel therefore that it has sufficient data to give formal guidance, but it wants to address some specific feature of an offence rather than the whole offence. A recent example uh, concerns an offence of defilement of a child. But while everyone concerned would accept that the guideline judgments of the Court of Appeal are of great value to trial judges, they do tend to be based on previous decisions of that court and on the Court of Criminal Appeal and um, therefore on a potentially unrepresentative selection of cases. Because the Court of Appeal only hears appeals from the Central Criminal Court and the Circuit Court and also the Special Criminal Court, but that's in really a category of its own. And it only deals with uh, appeals uh, <clears throat> relating to matters dealt with on indictment. And um, appeals are only taken in a minority of all of those cases. 
So it's this feature that leads me to what may be the biggest hurdle to the production of guidelines under the Act at the moment. We don't have a comprehensive set of data about sentencing practice in Ireland, and the committee is going to have to establish ways of getting the data that we need and of monitoring the impact of guidelines when they're produced. So for this purpose, we have started by engaging a very impressive international team uh, led by Professor Cyrus Tata of Strathclyde University. And the purpose is to assess met methodological approaches to sentencing data and analysis. The team includes Dr. Jay Gormley, also of Strathclyde, Professor Julian Roberts of Oxford University's Center for Criminological Research, Professor Cassia Spoon of Arizona State University, and of course our own Tom O'Malley, now Tom O'Malley Senior Counsel. <coughs> we have received a draft of the first of three interim reports envisaged in the contract. So this document is confidential for the moment. Uh, it's a draft document and there will be feedback from the committee to it. But I can tell you that it's a literature review of the existing sentencing methodologies and data in Ireland. I think it's also fair to say, and it won't come <clears throat> as a great surprise to any of you, that the draft report is not finding any current single source of data that will meet the needs of the committee. The next stage of the research will be a literature review of sentencing methodologies and best practice in comparable jurisdictions where a body similar to the committee has been established. The third report will contain contain recommendations in data collection and analysis. And the fourth final report will combine all of the findings and recommendations after feedback and discussions with the committee. Meanwhile, the committee has been working on the formulation of a process for the development of guidelines. Uh, it, this document is close to finalization and will, when completed, be published on the Judicial Council website. So what we're trying to do here, the objective is to demonstrate commitment to evidence-based <clears throat> best practice. Uh, we will be publishing a step-by-step -step framework for the production of any form of guideline, while allowing for the possibility that in some circumstances, that framework may be, it may be necessary to abridge or vary the, the procedure. Whatever shape the framework finally takes, it will certainly have to involve research and appropriate consultation stages. We have received valuable help in this task from Dr. Owen Gilfoyle and Dr. Ian Marder, who's with us this evening, and also from the Scottish Sentencing Council, and that's a body that's been in existence since 2015, so obviously has uh, useful experience to share. We, tr we have tried to draw on their experience and we agree with their advice to the effect that while it's important to get the development process right, it's nonetheless possible to make some progress on offence or offender specific guidelines at the same time. So with this possibility in mind, uh, we conducted an informal survey of the judiciary earlier this year in which we asked judges to identify what they saw as priority areas for the committee's work. And there are certain themes that came through quite strongly. They include sexual offences, driving offences causing fatalities, and recurring issues in cases um, concerning offences committed in the context of a past or ongoing relationship between the victim and the offender. Uh, this last category is of particular concern to the district court, since many of the relevant offences are triable summarily only. So we hope to engage a researcher in the coming months to carry out a research project with those judges who deal with criminal cases most frequently in the district court. And the intention is that they will be interviewed in some depth about their experience dealing with this particular category of case as well as about more general or systemic issues in district court sentencing. Uh, I want to stress here the importance of remembering the constitutional position of the district court at all times in this context. A great many indictable offences are by statute also triable summarily in the district court. And then with 
In relation to those offences, therefore, the legislature has envisaged that the facts may present as minor matters within the meaning of the Constitution. So it's essential that we don't produce guidelines that appear to have the effect of removing categories of offence from the jurisdiction of the district court by setting the sentencing parameters in a, such a way that only the higher courts would have jurisdiction to deal with them. Uh, finally, uh, I'm keen on keeping to my time, but I want to say something about research opportunities in the future in the hopes that it may be of interest to some of those present. Uh, when the committee gives out contracts, uh, any contracts over a certain value have to go through the full formal uh, procurement process. But we do envisage that there will from time to time be the need to engage a researcher for a smaller scale project, it doesn't have to go through the full process. So we have tried to devise a system, um, uh, a fair system for the giving out of contracts of this sort. And what we've decided to do uh, is to establish a research register for suitably qualified persons. So the idea is that where the committee proposes to engage a researcher for a particular project, it will select not more than 10 persons from the register and those persons will be invited to submit expressions of interest or proposals uh, for the project. Uh, what we're asking is that applicants for entry in the register must have as a minimum a postgraduate qualification at the level of a master's degree or be currently engaged in a PhD in law, criminology, sociology or social science, and they will have to have appropriate research experience. I should stress here that selection will be entirely within the discretion of the committee, having regard to our own assessment of the skills and experience necessary for any particular project. So there's no guarantee that inclusion on the register uh, will, will mean that you will be invited to su submit proposals or still less that you'll actually be offered work, but it is a way of putting yourself up for consideration. Um, so in summary, um, as to what the committee is doing at present, our approach is to assess the information that is already available, to devise and adopt methods of obtaining relevant data in the future, and to put in place a robust process for the drafting of guidelines specific to either categories of offence or categories of offender. This of necessity is not something that can be done swiftly. We do hope to do it, however, efficiently and effectively. And I, I will leave it at that and thank you for your attention. Many thanks, Ms. Justice O'Malley, for your opening, uh, for your keynote address and for, you know, reminding us, we, we know in many other areas about the challenges of, of data, um, but the importance of consultation and a reminder that this, this is a process that is ongoing. It's very, very valuable. I'm now delighted to introduce our second speaker, Sheriff Principal Craig Turnbull. Sheriff Principal Turnbull attended the University of Strathclyde and was admitted as a solicitor in uh, 1988. He was appointed part-time sheriff in 2011 and full-time sheriff in 2014 before being appointed Sheriff Principal of Glasgow and Strathkelvin in 2016. He was appointed to the Scottish Sentencing Council in late 2020, where he chairs the Sentencing Process Committee and also sits on the Sentencing Young People Committee. We have been very interested in watching the developments in Scotland. Sheriff Principal Turnbull will speak on lessons from the Scottish Sentencing Council, how to develop a principled approach to sentencing. Thank you. Um, good evening. It's, uh, it's a genuine pleasure to, to speak to you this evening um, in relation to the work carried out by the Scottish Sentencing Council. Um, in particular, I'd like to talk to you tonight about the development of our first three guidelines, how these provide the foundation for our future work and how we took into account the position of victims in the development of those guidelines. Um, as Mr. Justice O'Malley mentioned earlier, that the Scottish Sentencing Council was established in October 2015 as an independent advisory body. It carries out a range of work concerning sentencing, including the preparation of sentencing guidelines for the courts uh, in Scotland at all levels. 
The Council decided to focus initially on general guidelines applying to all offences in Scotland, rather than on areas of particular public concern, such as, for example, sexual offending. Unlike many other jurisdictions in Scotland, the, the fundamental principles and purposes of sentencing and the sentencing process, that is the various steps judges go through when making sentencing decisions, have never previously been expressly defined in any single document. The Council thought it important to address this lacuna, considering the resulting guidelines would not only be of benefit to the public, but would also form a principled framework for future offence specific guidelines. So the Council's first guideline, Principles and Purposes of Sentencing, came into force in November 2018 and applies to all offenders. It contains our core principle of sentencing, which is that sentences must be fair and proportionate. And it provides that all relevant factors must be considered, including the seriousness of the offence, the impact on the victim and others affected by the case, and the circumstances of the offender. So the, the position is clear, I'd suggest. A fair and proportionate sentence will include consideration of the impact on any victim. The guideline also lists possible purposes of a sentence, protection of the public, which includes deterring offending behaviour, punishment, rehabilitation, providing the opportunity to make amends and expressing disapproval of offending behaviour. It is for the court to decide, in the absence of provision in another guideline or other legal requirement, which particular purpose or purposes should apply and which, if any, should be given greater or lesser emphasis. This allows the court to take full account of the circumstances of each case and to select a sentence with a view to achieving more than one purpose. This work naturally flowed into the question of how courts actually arrive at sentencing decisions. And this became the subject of the second general guideline, the sentencing process, which applies to all offenders sentenced on or after the 22nd of September of this year. So this has been in force effectively for a month. Uh, the sentencing process, process guideline sets out an eight-step process for reaching sentencing decisions and is available on our website for anyone who wants the details. We took the time to get this right as the structure of the sentencing process guideline will inevitably inform the shape of our forthcoming offence-specific guidelines. We're presently working on guidelines covering offences of causing death by driving and sexual offences, including rape, sexual assault and the possession of indecent images. It's presently envisaged that the forthcoming guidelines will follow the structure set out in the process guideline while providing additional detail about the factors to be considered when assessing the seriousness of an offence covered by the guideline or the particular aggravating and mitigating circumstances which might apply. Our third general guideline, Sentencing Young People, was submitted to the High Court of Justiciary in September, um, a hearing scheduled to take place um, in the next few weeks, uh, at the beginning of November. If the High Court approves the guideline, as it must do for our guidelines to have effect, we anticipate that the Sentencing Young People guideline will enter into force in late January 2022. This guideline will apply to all offences where the person being sentenced is a young person. Drawing on the latest research and evidence around cognitive development and how this can be affected by experiences of trauma and adversity, it defines a young person as anyone under the age of 25 at the time of a plea or finding of guilt. Um, the, the draft guideline at this stage sets out the ways in which sentencing a young person is different from sentencing an older person. For example, uh, why rehabilitation is a primary consideration and why a young person's intellectual and emotional maturity should be considered when assessing their culpability for an offence. This is a key part of the court's assessment of the seriousness of an offence, which in terms of the process guideline is dependent on two things, the culpability of the offender and the harm caused to any victim. Courts in Scotland are not required to follow our guidelines, but they must have regard to them once approved by the High Court. And if they decide not to follow an approved guideline, they must state their reasons for so doing. A point worth making about our guideline development is that we're obliged by statute to carry out consultation on a draft version of all our guidelines before we finalise and submit them to the High Court for approval. 
We're required to consult the Scottish ministers, uh, the Lord Advocate, who's the head of the Scottish Prosecution Service, and such other persons as we consider appropriate. One of the first decisions that the Council took was that it would carry out a full public consultation on each of its guidelines. In addition, we carry out a variety of in-person engagement and research work. We talk to sentencers to establish sentencing practice, and we consult the judiciary on draft guidelines. We engage with victims and survivors groups, practitioners and other stakeholders. We carry out focus group research. We attend and speak at relevant conferences. We publish literature reviews and research on our website. And this proved to be of particular assistance with our Young People Guideline, where we prepared the ground by commissioning and publishing a review by the University of Edinburgh of the evidence on cognitive and emotional maturity in adolescence and its relevance in judicial contexts. This review confirmed that, as I've already mentioned, we would be justified in defining, defining a young person uh, for the purpose of the guideline as someone under 25. We've also published on our website a significant amount of material aimed at improving awareness. These resources and the guidelines are already being used for educational purposes, and the Council is also promoting them as a basis for training for policy, criminal justice and advocacy, and support organisations in addition, they will hopefully assist the media in understanding and accurately reporting sentencing decisions. Uh, it, it should be said there are also benefit in terms of judicial training, in terms of new judges coming on board. Uh, for those who have never sentenced before, the benefit of a guideline uh, is already accepted as being very substantial. And we are, at least we hope, um, as transparent as we can be about our work. We have the advantage as perhaps you do as well, of operating in a relatively small jurisdiction. We know our stakeholders and they have come to know us. Um, this process of consultation, engagement, research and public information takes time, but it informs our approach to the drafting of our guidelines and it's important that we get our guidelines right. Our, our credibility depends on it. We want to avoid unintended consequences. And we want our guidelines to be useful to the widest possible range of users. I, I can give you a, a concrete example of how this process affected the provisions regarding victims in one of our guidelines. So, during the consultation on the Young People Guideline, concerns were raised about the lack of reference to victims in the draft guideline. The, the assessment of the seriousness of offence, as I said earlier, depends on the level of culpability of the offender and on the level of harm caused. The Young People Guideline provides that youth may affect the court's assessment of culpability. Now, the Council has a desire not to repeat material across guidelines as far as possible. Um, so, as this is an offender-focused guideline, victims were not directly referenced in the draft that was consulted upon. But in response to the concerns that were raised in the consultation process, and to better explain the interaction between this guideline, the Young Person Guideline, and the other guidelines, the version submitted for approval now makes it clear that the assessment of the level of harm is not affected by the assessment of maturity. And while rehabilitation is a primary consideration, it notes that the other purposes of sentencing may also apply to a greater or lesser degree. So without altering the purpose of the guideline, this should make its intended effect clearer and perhaps provide reassurance to victims that any harm suffered by them is not diminished by the application of this guideline and remains central to the court's consideration. In, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd remind you that our council is still at a reasonably early stage of its existence. But if there are lessons to be learned from our experience as you start your own programme of work, can I suggest these? Firstly, whether or not you turn them into guidelines, you need to be absolutely sure about your own principles and purposes of sentencing and your own sentencing process, as these will inform everything that you do. Secondly, consult and engage as widely as you can. And thirdly, be transparent in doing so. If you're doing good work, and you will be, publicise it. Let people see your research. Provide materials which are of assistance to anyone who wants to know more about sentencing. The more open you are, the more productive your relationships with the judiciary, with stakeholders and with the media will be. Thank you very much.
thank you so much, uh, Sheriff Principal Turnbull. Uh, a rallying cry. So interesting to hear the emphasis on the, the principles and purposes, the emphasis on consultation and engagement and the transparency and the publication. Very struck and very interesting your comments regarding supporting the media in terms of how it reports. And this is absolutely essential to supporting public confidence in, in the justice system. So I'm delighted now to introduce our next speaker who IPRT has wanted to bring to Ireland for the longest time. So we're, we're doing it virtually, but we will in person. Professor Michael Tonry is currently the McKnight Presidential Professor of Criminal Law and Policy and Director of the Institute on Crime and Public Policy at the University of Minnesota. He has previously worked as a professor of law and public policy and director of the Institute of Criminology at Cambridge University. He has also been a visiting professor in numerous other universities and has written many books and countless articles and topics relating to criminology, punishment and sentencing, including a recent book, Doing Justice, Preventing Crime, which is published by Oxford University Press. Uh, he has, Professor Tonry has previously served as president of both the American and European Societies of Criminology, and this evening he is going to speak for us on the topic, Doing Justice, Preventing Crime, How to Build a More Just and Effective System of Sentencing and Punishment. You're very welcome, Professor Tonry. Oh, thank you very much. Am I muted or can you hear me? Uh, we, I can hear you. And I guess everybody else can. Let me say at the outset, uh, just, I'm sure no one in your audience except possibly you and Professor Julian Roberts of Oxford, if he's watching, has ever heard of me before. So I wanted to say something uh, about my background. In 1976, I was the so-called staff director to the first effort in the world to develop something called a sentencing commission or a sentencing council. Funded by the U.S. Department of Justice, we simulated the process in a high-level elite way with federal, federal Court of Appeals judges, the Deputy U.S. Attorney General, the head of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, to go through the process. So that's 45 or six years ago. And since then, I worked with probably 15 of the American states as they develop sentencing guidelines, and on sentencing policy in a bunch of countries, Scandinavia, Germany, Australia, New Zealand, a little bit in Canada, little bit more as an advisor to the Home Office in England and Wales um, than elsewhere. I only say that because this talk is mostly about normative matters, but it winds up being about um, practical matters of developing sentencing standards for a jurisdiction. So if, if you can see my PowerPoint, you will see that it gives a title. Now there's going to be a second title PowerPoint. So it's the same thing. The reason I've given you two is to focus on the cover, uh, pretentious on my part from the Sistine Chapel ceiling by Michelangelo, of Judgment Day. Judgment Day. Now that book is not only about punishment philosophy. Fairly unusually in my trade, I work in philosophy, sentencing policy, and quantitative empirical research on the effects of sanctions. This book is about all three, but you would think from the cover that it was only about normative issues, and it's not, but this talk mostly is. Now, I give you that picture because um, I think in most people's heads, in, in an unstudied way, including probably lay people, um, if in, in thinking about what ought to be done with someone who has committed some kind of a non-trivial wrong, we tend to think that they ought to be punished justly. And, and being punished justly, philosophers would say, might ultimately mean being punished as God might do it. Now, God uh, has knowledge <laughs> that, that the rest of us don't. So we can't possibly know what God would want in dealing with a particular offense in light of all the circumstances of the offense, in light of the history and personality and characteristics and mental properties and so on of the offender. Um, God knows all that and presumably would know what justice required. Uh, human beings don't know that and our intuitions are widely different. So we can't get very close to it, but, 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 
this little talk is going to propose ways we might get a little closer than we typically do. So <clears throat> here's, here's an outline of my talk. The first is mysterious. It says, <laughs> I'm going to talk for 90 seconds, 45 seconds about the frog's perspective on justice from Biana Baristhenes. Then I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about what I think I would want the system to look like if one of my children uh, was to be sentenced. Then philosophy pattern, I'm just gonna represent those ideas, but in a more structural, jargon-ridden, serious philosophy way to talk about certain kinds of principles. And then I'm going to say something about the implications of what the first three sections are about uh, for sentencing policy in Ireland and anywhere else. <clears throat> the frogs. Beyond a Baristhenes, nobody knows how to pronounce that, and I don't either, so I guess. Um, one of the most famous of the pre-Socratic philosophers, observed, I'm just going to read this, observed of young boys playing on a summer's day by a stream in a grassy field. They found some frogs and Ion says, though the boys throw stones at frogs in jest, yet the frogs do not die in jest, but in earnest. I encountered this quotation when I was a student at Yale Law School many, many, many years ago. And it has always stuck with me. In my mind, it has always been the case that justice should be viewed from the frog's perspective. Justice should be viewed in terms of, in terms of punishment, in terms of what's going to happen, in terms of how it feels, in terms of who the frog is, and so on. It, it, this is it's trivializing my, my Sistine Chapel image. Um, but, but I think the frog's perspective is really important, vastly more important than the judge's perspective. In American sentencing policy, judges often seem to feel as if their ego or their status or something is in jeopardy if if discretion is taken from them, they're entitled to have their sentence imposed. I think that's nonsense. Sentencing isn't about judges. It's about justice to individuals. Okay, there's Bion. So <laughs> if, if, if we, well, some of you, I guess, no, nobody's in person. In person, I couldn't use this slide because it has too many words. Um, but if you're looking at it on the screen, then you can read the words as, as, as easily as I can. So I've thought through, you know, what if, what if one of my kids was in serious trouble? My goodness, what if I was in serious trouble? Um, what would I want done if, if they were criminally prosecuted and convicted of a crime? I think most people would want the same things for their kids or themselves or other people they love as I would for people I know and love. Um, I'm just going to we to talk about these in a great length, but I'd want them treated fairly and respectfully. That's fair enough. Doesn't happen often in American criminal courts where things are done by an assembly line and people see public defenders for 15 seconds when their bail hearing is called and so on. But that's what I would want. I would want people treated fairly and respectfully. Of course, I'd want all the people involved in processing cases to be impartial. Um, now that may seem to you uh, not, a, a, not a very ambitious thing to want, but in the United States, you may know, most prosecutors are politically elected and those who are appointed, even if they're civil servants, work for the top guy or gal. And the top guy or gal often has political issues in mind, media issues in mind, images they want to project. I hear bits of it even in the two presentations so far with this business of public reaction. Public reaction's got nothing to do with justice. Victims have nothing to do with justice. Victims have important interests. They need to be treated respectfully. They need to be kept well informed. They may need social services. They may need psychological services. Uh, but, but punishing offenders, justice to funders is not about victims. I would want, people I cared about to be treated in the same way everybody else is, but that is a way in which all the circumstances 
of their offense and of their lives should be taken into account sympathetically with respect and concern. Not stereotypes, not knee-jerk stuff, not this is a gang member and so such and such things follow. People should be considered, treatment as an equal is, is the philosophical term in distinction from equal treatment. Equal treatment means everybody gets mechanically treated the same way. Treatment as an equal means everybody's legitimate interests are considered with respect and concern. I would want them punished no more severely than they had to be, or they deserved to be. And if there were good reasons, less severely than that. Now that makes no, that, that should be completely uncontroversial. If we had a comprehensive system of sentencing that said, well, robbery with violence is punished more seriously than robbery without violence, and robbery under certain circumstances is more punished more severely than robbery under less circumstances, there's a natural hierarchy there of seriousness of punishments for robbery. And wherever a case falls in that hierarchy, they should never be punished more severely than that. That just seems simple. Um, whether people are retributivist or utilitarian, punishing people more than can be justified in principle is per se unjust. And then finally, if someone I know was involved in the criminal justice system and, 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 and facing sentencing, I would want them um, and, 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 and their behavior or their circumstances involve aspects of mental illness, drug dependence, fundamental deficiencies in human capital or other kinds of terrible handicaps and, 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 and limitations, I would want the system which was going to do something to them in the name of punishment to seriously attach or attack or consider those matters. Okay, those five things, nothing profound about it, uh, but if you were treating people justly, I think you would do all those things. Now, in philosophy talk, where we talk about principles of things, um, you can reduce those five considerations into principles of justice. The first one is the last thing I spoke about. Offenders should never be punished more severely. That can be justified by their blame the worthiness in respect to the severity of punishments justly imposed on others for the same and different offenses. That's a matter of proportionality. It's, a, it's an absolutely simple but fundamental requirement of justice that certainly the English are not very good at, the Americans are not very good at it, the Canadians are better, the Scandinavians are fantastic at it. They have very clear principles about what's more serious than what. Second, obviously these processes, given the interests that are at stake, right? people's liberty, their property, their reputations, and the craziness of the US, sometimes even their lives, and similar effects and consequences and ramifications for their children and their families and their loved ones, and sometimes their communities. Clearly, people need to be treated absolutely fairly and handedly by, by, by according to well-established policies and rules and implemented in good faith. That the, the American political prosecution system obviously is incompatible with that. Equal treatment, this is the point I made before, um, that people should be treated as equals. That does not mean equally treated. It means that everything that is germane to them, everything that if we had some glimmer of what's in God's eye, God would care about, um, should be taken into account. We should, we should treat people with respect as human beings with fundamental rights to, to, to justice. And, and, and we should be concerned about them and the effects of what's happening to them now and the effects of what we might do to them in the future. And then finally, and this also should be, um, I mean, this, this should be justice 101. This is, the word comes from, Jeremy Bentham, who also used the word frugality uh, in addition to parsimony. And it simply says, you know, if there are valid purposes to punish people, and he was mostly interested in deterrence, 
you may you can justify punishing people as much as deterrence requires, he would have said, uh, but not one, one bit more. Anything more is unjust because it, it can't be justified in terms of legitimate considerations to be taken into account in deciding how to punish people. Immanuel Kant and attributors would say exactly the same. If, if a punishment is one inch more severe than proportionality considerations justify, then it's unjust. Okay. So those, those four, that's my philosophy pattern. Those four principles are, are a way to restate more formally the, uh, the, the, the five practical, what would I want for my kids? And so what are the implications for sentencing policy? The first is, it sounds pretty grim in Ireland, you can't do this stuff unless you have really good data on past sentencing practices, unless you know what you're doing already and how consistent it is, what the range of, 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 of outcomes is, what the outliers look like, and you can't devise sensible policies without really good forecasting. And so that means major, deep, original data collection in a country like Ireland. England should have done that. They never did it, which is one of the reasons why the English sentencing guidelines in, in all and guidance in all its iterations has been half big. Um, upper limit, buy on frogs. If you're ever going to punish people more justly than the norm, it should be very rare and, 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 uh, um, judges have to jump through hoops to, to make the case that they can justify doing something more severe than normal. Legal force, the, the, the English blow this entirely. Their, their guidelines are, are, it's no time to talk about it, but make the guidelines presumptively applicable. This is what the judge ordinarily should do in this kind of a case. That's part of making upward deviations very difficult. And if you have presumptive guidelines, um, you then can require judges to give full explanations of why they are imposing a sentence more severe than is ordinarily justified. And then finally, if you're going to have presumptive guidelines that have legal force and judges can be required to explain why they did something else, you need a meaningful, toothy, I described, pellet review standard. Um, the phrase that got developed in the US in the couple of sentencing guidelines jurisdictions that are pretty normatively admirable um, is that judges have to have substantial and compelling reasons to impose a sentence more severe than would normally be required. Now, why might they do that? Uh, the research evidence wouldn't justify doing it on deterrent or incapacitative grounds, but if you believed it was, or if there were things about the seriousness of the crime, and gratuitous violence or something, those might well be substantial and justifying reasons. So there we are. Um, I went through my four points. We did buy on. We did what, what I would want for my kids. We did what I want for my kids in punishment pattern, philosophy pattern. And, and now we've done implications for sentencing guidelines development in Ireland and anywhere else. And that's the end. So I relinquish uh, the screen and, and invite the organizers to take back over. Many thanks, Professor Tonry. Thank you so much for that, for stretching our thinking and making us think a little bit differently about it. Um, it, it, it reminds me of a wonderful conference in Cork I attended some years ago when Professor Joanna Shrapland uh, reviewed the evidence of what um, different parties had received from the start of justice. And really what she found that people who had been both been victims of crime and also perpetrators of crime, there was that key core uh, need that everybody had for justice and fairness, justice and fairness. So thank you so much. Um, so now I'm delighted to introduce the first of our three um, panel respondents to the, the three excellent speeches as uh, presentations we've heard this evening. Uh, the first is a man who needs very little introduction among us because he's just such a constructive engager across the sector. So Dr. Ian Marder joined the Department of Law in Maynooth University as assistant professor in 2018, where he chairs the MA in Comparative Criminology and Criminal Justice. Dr. Mar Marder's doctoral research focused on the institutionalization of restorative justice in the police. 
He founded and runs the Community of Restorative Researchers and is a founding member of the European Forum for Restorative Justice uh, Research Committee and the Criminal Justice Alliance Restorative Justice Expert Group. You're very welcome, Ian. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fina, and thank you so much to the speakers for their excellent presentations this afternoon. Uh, just to give a few reflections I've been uh, drafting as they've been speaking, I suppose, firstly, as a strong advocate of transparency in criminal justice policymaking, I'm especially grateful to Justice O'Malley for speaking publicly about the Guideline Committee's work and in relation to its ongoing work, such as its procedures and reports, its uh, priorities and intentions, and the questions it has and the conclusions it comes to, I really hope that the committee adopts a policy and a culture of ongoing transparency. My own research on sentencing guidelines has two broad themes. Firstly, with some statisticians and other colleagues in England, we conducted empirical research exploring the impact of guidelines on judicial decision making. And we found that guidelines can increase individualization, but do not necessarily do so. And also that guidelines can increase sentence severity, but again, do not necessarily do so. The other theme of this research, which focuses on guideline design, is perhaps of more immediate interest. And this work focuses firstly on the interaction between the guideline format, its contents, and cognitive biases and judicial decision making. And then secondly, and more recently, with my colleague Owen Guilfoyle, we focused on the types of data needed to design and monitor the sentencing guidelines in Ireland. And also on the research, the, the, the areas of research and the areas of knowledge that can be incorporated into those guidelines so that sentencing in Ireland reflects the best available evidence on how to reduce harm in society. And it was great also to hear Justice O'Malley talk about the need to collect data in order to assess current sentencing practices. And that includes, but really isn't limited to, the nature and extent of any sentencing inconsistency, or uh, perhaps more precisely, the nature and extent of any unwarranted disparities, because of course there are all sorts of warranted disparities, like um, the previous speakers were saying, you want them to take lots of different things into account, but there are certain things that we don't want uh, disparities to form because those have been taken into account. And what I also like about some of uh, Michael's previous work, such as his 2014 article, A 10-Step Blueprint for Moving Past Mass Incarceration, is that a lot of his work seeks to translate the criminological knowledge into sentencing policies. And that's really exactly what I hope the committee uh, takes advantage of the blank slate available to them in order to prioritize. And that's because, it, we, we, we can't uh, plead ignorance when we're asked whether more or less punishment is good for society. We know that in the overwhelming majority of situations, the use of retributive rationales and the use of you know, further punitive measures will make society less safe. So Ireland's guidelines should reflect this by incorporating the principle of parsimony, as Michael says, and this also provides an opportunity, I think, to reframe sentencing as something that can actively contribute to the safety of society, the health and the connectedness of society. And I say contribute intentionally because criminal justice cannot achieve this alone. So sentencing should ensure that people have access to the services that will help to prevent and reduce harm rather than actually creating further barriers to these services by prioritizing retributive and punitive rationales. Some of you will know that uh, most of my work is in the area of restorative justice. And as such, I spend most of my time really engaging with victims of crime and victim services. And I also teach victimology at Maynooth University. And in this work, I've always found it entirely understandable, uh, entirely reasonable, and entirely unavoidable that many victims will at some point harbor a desire for retribution. And 
maybe a slightly different line than Michael took. You know, I do think that victims are among the stakeholders to the justice process whose needs and interests must be taken into account and balanced. But what I would say is that I think we're doing victims a disservice if we uh, continue to pretend effectively that their needs will be wholly or even primarily met by the criminal justice process and by sentencing. And we know this from the victimological research. This research is clear that engagement with the criminal justice process is generally anti-therapeutic for victims. We know that many victims' needs do not relate to what happens to the perpetrator. And we also know that the services which can actually be designed to meet victims' needs are chronically underfunded. And some of the really important ones don't even exist in some jurisdictions and in some parts of Ireland. So there's kind of two things here. One is around what do we want sentencing to look like and how can that uh, maximize, you know, how can we uh, maximize the return of sentencing to society? And then somewhat separately, I suppose, if we're really serious about supporting victims, our priority there should be investment in both basic victim services and also innovative victim services. And some of these, like restorative justice, may, but don't necessarily have an impact on the criminal justice procedure. But some of these, like, for example, a couple of years ago, New Zealand brought in paid leave for victims of domestic violence. That's not contingent at all on what happens to the perpetrator. So in uh, having these new guidelines, Ireland can either kind of follow the paths of other countries, you know, some of which Michael pointed out, I think rightly, you know, haven't used guidelines to their full potential, or it can take this really substantial opportunity, this blank slate, and ensure that the principles and purposes of sentencing and any subsequent thematic or offense-specific guidelines will reflect the best available evidence. And that's what I'll finish on. Thanks, Fina. Thank you so much, Ian. And I just, I suppose it's worth restating IPRT's perspective on this really is that we are clear that people must be held to account for the harm that they have caused, but in a way that does not cause further harm. I'm interested also in the use of the, you know, when we use the word balance, and I know our colleagues in the ICCL have been, you know, we've, we've learned a lot from them in terms of it's not as much about balance, but it's about meeting the rights and needs and justice demands of uh, different people and different perspectives at the same time. Um, I'm delighted now to invite our next respondent, um, Nolene Blackwell, who is CEO of the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre. The Dublin Rape Crisis Centre aims to prevent and heal the trauma of rape and sexual abuse through a range of services to support survivors of sexual violence, as well as carry out broader advocacy to influence change in policies, services and legislation that affects victims of sexual violence. Prior to taking up this role, Nolene worked as Director General at the Free Legal Advice Centre for over 10 years, working to achieve equal access to justice for all, and as Managing Solicitor of Blackwell and, Co and Company in Dublin, particularly focusing on refugee, immigration and family law. Nolene is also a longtime civil society colleague and constructive sounding board, and thank you so much, Nolene, for giving your time here today. It's a great pleasure and it's a, it's a privilege to be asked to do this short response um, and, and I will keep it very short um, and just really from the point of view of how important sentencing is in the uh, accountability in relation to sexual violence uh, because you, uh, as, as you all well know um, sexual offences are that bit different from other types of crime in that primarily the victim and the offender are known to each other, are often in a very um, close familial or work or uh, community relationship. And, and therefore the disruption that is caused in reporting into the criminal justice system for, uh, uh, for a victim of sexual violence is huge and the disruption it causes to their community. So it is not surprising that so few people will report uh, um, in, into the criminal justice system at all 
There is no really reliable evidence available, but the best available evidence looks like about 10% at most of those who are victims of sexual offences will actually proceed to an investigation of their crime and dealing uh, and going forward to, to uh, a hearing. Uh, and of that 10%, the attrition rate is huge. I see Deputy Batrick was in on the conversation earlier, um, and she had done some work on this as well. So it's, it's clear to everybody in the system that those who bring an initial complaint of, sexual, of a sexual offence are very likely to drop out for a lot of reasons. Um, and, and those reasons are very varied, but undoubtedly, one of the things that makes somebody want to bring such a complaint at all, to go through um, a, an intimate uh, inquisition into uh, their personal affairs, is they want to get this mythical justice that has been mentioned so often in so many contexts by, context by previous speakers for themselves or for somebody else. They want this not to happen to somebody else. And, and we see them in the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre, as do others who work with victims of sexual violence, often before they make that decision to go ahead with an investigation or early on into an investigation. And undoubtedly, one of the things that they need to know is what is going to happen at the end of this process. If they go through with this, is the person who could be their partner, family member, somebody in close to them in their community, is this person, if convicted, like what are they likely to get by way of a sentence? And right now, we have to say, well, do you know what, if you're a really good lawyer, you can go back along and, and look over the cases. But as Judge O'Malley said in, in her presentation, even what, what is identified out of those cases comes from a very small pool as well. And very often we have to say, do you know what? We can give you a general idea that this has been the trend over the past few years, but it kind of depends on the judge on the day. Uh, it depends on oh, so many other things. And we so miss not having sentencing guidelines. So while I totally understand and I'm here to respond, I suppose, as somebody a little bit outside of the system now, although I, I still love the law and, and all it can do for justice. I feel despondent that it seems like it is going to be a very long time before we come up with sufficient data to build good sentencing guidelines, which would allow us to say in fairness to uh, those who are thinking even of, uh, be, of, prosecution, of, of, prosecu of being a witness in a prosecution, to, to people who may already know what abuse looks like from the person against whom the complaint is made, to say, I don't know whether he will or she will get a sentence at the end of this that justifies um, the, the complaint or that that they, they won't be able to use their position of abuse. So that was why in some ways I, I uh, had, when I came in first, I found that lovely sentencing database that was started way back before the last recession and which had the unfortunate name of ISIS or the acronym of ISIS. Um, but it really was, looked like such a useful thing for us to be able to say, that you could actually look at a sentencing database and work out roughly what the range of sentences were going to be. But, and one of the most useful things we've had in recent years is a Supreme Court decision, DPP um, and FE, uh, which was uh, where there's a judgment in December of 2019, where in some ways it is, it is nearly clear enough, it is clear enough to give that judgment intact to a, whole, uh, to a whole range of people, and maybe to edit it for some others, to say that the Supreme Court has set these guidelines in relation to rape. You are unlikely to get a suspended sentence. You have the naught to seven, and as Judge Malley was saying, you have those various ranges along the way, the mitigating factors, the aggravating factors, the breach of trust being the huge aggravating factor in, in rape by uh, a man of his wife. So, those kind of things are so helpful, so useful to us. And what I took from today, though, 
was what uh, Sheriff Principal Craig Turnbull spoke about uh, where the Scottish Sentencing Council is moving forward that even if it is going to take us a long time to gather the data for um, specific offences, maybe we could do more on the principles, on the identification of main sentencing uh, provisions, the, the principles that also uh, Professor Tonry spoke about, you know, that we could set those out and that they would be on the Judicial Council website so that we could say, look, within reason, this is what uh, what, what is going to be taken into account. It is also an education process for people who either think nothing will happen if they report into the justice system or who think that they will get you know, that they will get blood. So it would be a way of actually educating people who have to go through a very hard process anyway in what in, in managing their own expectations and it would be good for us as a society because it would, be some encouragement to uh, for people to, uh, to to complain at all into the justice system, and if we don't have those people complaining in, and if people aren't held to account, then our society is a less safe place. I leave it at that, Fiona. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nolene, and thank you for giving your time and for engaging. I know you're very busy at the moment. And really, I'm really struck by one of your senses, which is, you know, uh, people who are victims and survivors of crime, they want this not to happen to someone else. And we know there are many ways that that can be, if not achieved, but certainly better achieved. But the other question about what is going to happen at the end of this process, and actually everyone would like to know this, you know, so it's that, if not certainty, certainly expectations um, would benefit everyone in the system. So thank you so much, Nolene, for that. Um, so um, our, our final respondent of the, of the evening, I'm delighted to introduce our, our very own Molly Joyce of IPRT. Molly joined IPRT as Legal and Public Affairs Manager and Deputy Director in November 2020. Molly came to IPRT having most recently worked as a practicing barrister in London, specialising in the areas of public law and police law. Uh, prior to this, she worked with young men in prison and at risk of going to prison in the UK-based charity Key for Life. Welcome, Molly. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, it's lovely to be here. Um, and also, just I want to say at the very outset, thank you so much to everyone who spoke this evening. Um, I have been obviously involved in organising this event, and it's, it's been it surpassed my expectations in terms of the conversation it started and ideas that it has presented, and um, all of which have kind of challenged and got me thinking in lots of different ways. Um, I will keep my remarks very brief because we're coming to the end and I want to leave some time for questions. But what I just want to say at the outset is, you know, repeat, um, I suppose, one of IPRT's kind of key mottos, which is respect for rights rights in the penal system with prison as a last resort. And now the latter part of this advocating for the use of imprisonment as a last resort um, is a point I will come back later to, um, but suffice to say that the progressive reform of sentencing law and practice is one of our key strategic goals. Um, and that goal has received a renewed focus with the onset of the Legal and Public Affairs Programme, which as Fiona mentioned, started last year when I joined the organisation and for which I am responsible. Um, and it's also you know, great timing in respect of this programme because it comes at the same time as the, um, or at roughly the same time as the recent establishment of the Sentencing Guidelines and Information Committee. And um, I just want to echo uh, Ian in, in you know, thanking Miss Justice O'Malley again for making her remarks tonight. And it's been wonderful to hear firsthand from the chair of this newly formed committee. And in the time I have, I want to just make uh, address really three key points in kind of response to what we have heard this evening. Um, and that's in respect of first, the issue of data, sentencing data. Second, um, what we can learn from Scotland. Um, and third, the kind of uh, principles and the philosophy, philosophy, philosophical principles underpinning um, you know, how we might go about developing sentencing guidelines. In respect of the first point in sentencing data, um, we really welcome Ms Justice O'Malley's acknowledgement that there is a current lack of comprehensive sentencing data in Ireland, and um, particularly in respect of the lower level courts, the district courts, where it is quite hard to understand what is actually happening. Um, and also, and perhaps most importantly, her recognition of the significant amount of work that now needs to be done in collecting and analysing that data. Um, and again, that was a point, you know, that the importance of data has been emphasised by Professor Tonry and also by Ian and, and many others tonight. And um, I suppose two quick points in respect to that from our perspective. First, it's just to make the point that, you know, 
any data collection and analysis, we believe will have to become a systematic part of the, of the criminal justice system. And, and it's important that it's not just a one-off uh, point in time exercise, and then that that is kind of built into the system so that as we begin to develop sentencing guidelines, we consistently have a flow of data available to us. And, and second is the point about transparency and public availability of that data. And I think Nolan really, you know, so eloquently put the kind of importance of having data available. So, you know, not just for organizations like ourselves, although it's important to our work, but also for organizations supporting victims and supporting victims' families. And, and so again, I'd really welcome Ms. Justice Zoe Malley's um, remarks in respect of the uh, publication of summaries of the higher court judgments and guidelines. That is, you know, a really important uh, first step in terms of making that kind of publicly available information. And we hope to see more of that as data begins to be collected. In respect to the second point about principles, you know, what are principles and processes and what we can learn from Scotland, it's been really wonderful to hear from Sheriff Principal Turnbull and thank you so much again for joining us this evening. We often look to Scotland as a kind of best practice example and as you said, another kind of small jurisdiction which we can kind of emulate in, in many um, respects. And, and uh, you know, Sheriff Principal Turnbull spoke about how it was the first time for Scotland when they set up their council of having the opportunity to really set out the principles and processes of sentencing and, you know, that's similarly where we're at now in Ireland. It is our first opportunity really to kind of set out in writing what we want our principles underpinning our sentencing to be and what we want those processes to be. Um, and so it's really, again, welcome to see that Ms. Justice O'Malley's remarks in respect of looking to the Scottish Sentencing Council um, and also potentially developing a framework for how sentencing guidelines will be developed. And again, it's something we'll really look forward to reading when it's published in due course. Um, and I was also really struck um, by Sheriff Principal Turnbull's um, you know, many remarks in respect, in respect of the importance of consultation, engagement with the public and transparency. And I really you know, it's something IPRT strongly agrees with and, and really believes it's going to be an incredibly important part of this sentencing committee's work as it goes forward. And, and in particular, you know, I think that that public education and public awareness bit is going to be so important. I mean, I'd recommend looking at the Scottish Sentencing Council, web, Council website, which I think has been put in the chat, and because it is an excellent example of how to communicate complex ideas in a straightforward, easy to read manner. It has things like myth busters, jog, jargon busters, and um, if you were the case, judge case studies, all of which are really useful tools that can be used by, you know, teachers, by people working with, you know, members of the public to help them understand how sentencing actually works. And, and you know, really that engagement too with the media, which Sheriff Principal Turnbull, in my view, is absolutely crucial because I think a lot of people don't have a very good understanding of how sentencing actually works and that we see, you know, a lot of rhetoric that can be quite damaging and it's damaging not just to the people involved, so the people who have maybe been convicted and sentenced, um, but also to victims um, and to um, survivors of, of different kinds of, of crimes. And so I think that consultation engagement with the public is going to be hugely important. And in respect of one point uh, on that is just to you know, make the point that in order to actually do this, of course, the Sentencing Guidelines um, and Information Committee in Ireland is going to need proper resourcing and funding. Um, and that's going to be something that needs to be committed to over the long term. And it's something that IPRT will very strongly be looking at and you know, advocating for the proper um, resourcing of the committee so that it is actually able to carry out the ambitious goals that have been set out for it in its legislation. Um, I'm slightly running over time, so I'll, I'll get to the last point, um, which is the kind of philosophical point. And I suppose, as I said, you know, I come back to the point that IPOT, um, you know, I, we're, we're led by an ethos of penal moderation and uh, penal parsimony. And, and, and that view is really based on the point that the size of, you know, our understanding and our belief that the size of our prison population is not simply a product of demographics or crime rates, but rather is the result of an interplay of law, politics and social factors within which sentencing law and practice is central and can actually make a really fundamental difference. And we really welcomed, you know, and I find uh, Professor Tommy's presentation extremely thought provoking. His book is extremely thought provoking and I'd recommend everyone here who's interested to, to have a read of it. And, and, and we really welcomed the inclusion of the principle of, uh, you know, parsimony within that but also recognize that other principles are important too. So fairness, proportionality, which of course are already within our Irish constitutional law, as well as equal treatment. But one thing that really um, stood out to me from Professor Tony's um, 
contributions, but also his book, is this idea that human dignity is what actually underpins all of those principles. And then that is kind of the, um, you know, encompasses all of those things. And I think that the principle of human dignity is a really interesting way in which you approach the idea of sentencing. I also think it potentially, now I, I'm not an expert in constitutional law, but I, I think it potentially has a role within Irish law. It's already a phrase kind of used within our constitution. It has some recognition. And maybe that is something that could be used as a way to kind of inform how we develop our sentencing guidelines going forward. And I think both Nolene and Ian have spoken really, again, eloquently about the, you know, the position of victims within all of this. And as Fiona has said, we are clear that, you know, it's, it's about holding people accountable, um, but in a way that doesn't uh, increase further harm. And, and I think that that is a really important, you know, that is, it's not a balancing, as Fiona said, but it is about how going forward we're going to meet the rights of all of the individuals concerned. And um, so I will, um, the, the last point I just really kind of want to finish on again, and it's kind of a more technical point, I suppose, in respect of the committee, but it's just about, you know, as I said, we're led by the principle of penal moderation. So I think it's going to be very important for us going forward that sentencing guidelines don't have the effect, um, whether that's intentional or, or inadvertent, of actually increasing sentences, which I think, you know, Professor Tanri alluded to, but it is something that we have seen in England and Wales where sentencing guidelines has come at the same time as an increase uh, or a, 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 an increase of a custodial or sentence inflation effectively across England and Wales. And, and that's something that we absolutely don't want to see. And, and it's going to be important that any guidelines that are implemented, that they can be monitored to make sure that they're not having that effect. And again, that comes back to resourcing to ensure that the committee is actually able to uh, you know, monitor the guidelines once they are brought into effect. And, and so I'll leave on that, uh, finish on that rather technical point, but I can see a lot of questions coming in, so hopefully we'll get a good discussion going. Thank you so much, Molly. Okay, it just serves me to do a few closing words and thanks to all of our speakers and respondents and for the, for the questions that we've gone bang on time. Um, so IPRT very much hopes that this seminar is the start of a conversation that will continue. And as an organization, IPRT looks forward to sentencing guidelines eventually being passed, which are evidence-based, fair, proportionate, and underpinned by a commitment to imposing the least punitive sanction in, in all cases. We are, however, hoping to learn and engage with others through events such as this seminar. And we believe the exchange and ideas and of ideas and information is invaluable. So it just leaves me now to, th to thank our keynote speaker, Ms. Justice Isolt O'Malley. Thank you so much for, it's been an honor to have you with us this evening. Also, thank you to our speakers, Sheriff Principal Turnbull and Professor Tonry, to our, all three of our respondents, Dr. Ian Marder, Nolene Blackwell, and Molly Joyce, who uh, has worn multiple hats this evening as the person who conceived of, programmed, coordinated, and then acted as respondent for this event. Thank you, Molly. Thanks as ever to the whole IPRT team, Pamela, Lorraine and Sarah Jane, along with our volunteers Ellen and Hannah for, uh, who make all of this happen. Thanks to the Irish Criminal Bar Association for jointly hosting the event. And we're very grateful to all our funders who make our work possible, in particular the Community Foundation for Ireland, who support the IPRT Legal and Public Policy Programme, which brought this event this evening. And thanks also to our core funders, Pubbel and the Department of Justice. So thank you everyone here for your support, and we look forward to meeting you again. Thank you.